The Magnavox Odyssey was the world's first commercially sold game console. The games are terrible. The controller is worse. It's not something that anyone would ever want to go back and play for entertainment. The Fairchild Channel F is the first video game console in a technological sense that we'd understand it. It used a microcontroller, and there were cartridges that had different ROM chips that you'd swap in and out to change what game you were playing. Of the nearly 30 games for it, there aren't many that you'd want to play even as a curiosity. If you ever got your hands on one, you'd find that the controllers are terrible to use, and the games are generally worse versions of what you'd find elsewhere. The Odyssey and the Channel F demonstrate that just because you're the first doesn't mean you're any good. In both cases, Atari was later to the market with comparable platforms, but the Atari game consoles were significantly better, and they became what the video game industry molded itself around. But it's still worth looking at the Odyssey and the Channel F. What approach were those pioneers taking when there wasn't anyone to model themselves on? What was it like to throw something against the wall and just see if it stuck? The Epoch Cassette Vision was Japan's very first cartridge-based video game system. And that's actually a lie. Epoch themselves had been importing the Atari VCS and reselling it in Japan. On store shelves, they called it the Epoch Cassette TV game, though they didn't even bother changing the box. They just put a tiny little label in Japanese on the front. Epoch had already been making video game consoles. They had Japan's very first video game console, a copy of Pong that they called TV Tennis, or Electro Tennis if you're reading the label on the console. Throughout the 70s, Epoch revised and reworked those game consoles. It had an entire line of platforms that you'd plug into your TV and could only play a few games. Naturally, they kept making Pong ones, but there was also a console dedicated to playing baseball games, and one that was specifically for a copy of Space Invaders. Epoch had the idea that because they were reusing so much of the same circuitry between all of these platforms, they could just smash them all together and release one platform with interchangeable cassettes. And that is how the monstrosity known as the Cassette Vision was born. I'm not going to say it's the weirdest video game console, because I've seen some weird video game consoles, but it's a strange compromise design that tries to be all things in one box. You have four rotary dials for playing your various Pong games, but they're placed so closely together that if you were playing a four-player variant, the kids would have to be right on top of each other. Below those are joysticks. You don't see them? It's these little silver levers right here. This is a spring-loaded two-axis controller. You can go left or you can go right. Both sides of the machine have one of those. Then there are the large square push buttons. You're intended to use those for the in-game actions. They're soft and squishy, though some of that might be the fact that they're 40 years old. The dead center of the system has a course selection, a five-way switch that is solely used to determine where you're going to throw a baseball over the plate. And above that is an audio style jack that you'd use for peripherals. Only one peripheral was ever made for the cassette vision. Finally, there's three buttons in the dead center of the console. Start, Auxiliary, and Select. The cassette vision only supports radio frequency out. It is a console from 1981 after all. And that means it generates a signal similar to a television station only instead of being transmitted through the air, it goes across a wire. RF signals aren't very good, they're prone to interference, which is why console manufacturers got away from them as soon as televisions that had other input started becoming more common. There were 11 games released for the cassette vision, numbered 1 through 12. Game number 10, Grand Champion, is a little bit confusing. The game had completed manufacturing and was getting ready to ship out to distributors, when a bug was found that rendered the game unplayable. Rather than remake all of those cartridges, Epoch chose to just not release it. Only one known copy of Grand Champion exists in the wild, so it won't be part of this series. Cassette Vision games are unusual, 
because they all contain their own microprocessor within them. And that comes back to Epoch's design philosophy with the system. They were taking their existing standalone consoles and splitting those off. So all of the control features for those consoles was offloaded to the cassettes. Now you might be saying to yourself, isn't this hugely wasteful and redundant? And to that I say, yes, yes it absolutely is. Many of the Cassette Vision games are just Epoch consoles reduced to a cartridge form. So at least they saved on development costs there. So the Cassette Vision is a poorly designed system with a ghastly interface and a microscopic library. Why on earth would I want to dedicate time to it? And that brings me back to the Odyssey and the Channel F. They're not good, but they are important. It's a key piece of technology from when video games were developing as a medium. And mediums don't develop in a vacuum. The Famicom did not emerge Athena-like from Masayuki Uemura's brow. And even the stumbling failures act as signposts. Looking at the cassette vision tells us a lot about where the Japanese video game industry was in 1981, and it will tell us a bit about where it's heading. In 1983, Epic would create a scaled-down version of the cassette vision. It wasn't compatible with all of the games, but it acted as a discount brand competitor to the Famicom. Similar to how I went through the Famicom's library, there's going to be one video a day on each of the cassette vision games. Most of these are going to be relatively short because they're very simple games. I'm playing on original, unmodified hardware, Partially because, at the time of this recording, there is no Cassette Vision emulator. The way that they offloaded the microprocessor to the cartridge has made an emulator annoying to create. If you want to get your own Cassette Vision, well, mine cost 3,000 yen and it included the box and a game. There was also 4,000 yen shipping on top of that, but the console was 3,000 yen. Collecting the cartridges proved to be a much more significant challenge. Cassette Vision stuff isn't widely available in large quantities, and so you'll find two listings for them. Video game dealers who want a lot of money for what they have, and people who have cleared out their garage and are selling a bunch of Cassette Vision stuff for next to nothing. As a result, I've got extra copies of most of the Cassette Vision games. The cassettes themselves aren't actually cassette sized, they're a little bit larger than that. Though the package that they came in is a bit like what was used for an audio cassette. The games don't have actual manuals, the instructions were all printed on the back side of the cover, and I happen to have that for almost all of the games in the set. After the Cassette Vision puttered around for a few years, managing to not get much traction, Epoch looked at the exploding console market in Japan and decided to try again. So there's a successor system called the Super Cassette Vision, but I will get to that in time.